Hey everyone. Pollution is something our region deals with a lot. And recently, a state plan to lower it was rejected by the Environmental Protection Agency. So what does that mean for our health and for industry? Jennifer Hadaya of Airlines Houston joins me to explain why this rejection should matter to us all. It's Monday, October 23rd, 2023. I'm Raheel Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Jennifer, welcome back into CityCast Houston. How are you? I am great. Happy to be here. Excited to talk about this uh, ozone decision. <laughs> okay. You got to tell me about ozone because I am so confused. Now, I always thought ozone was the thing that's protecting us from the harmful <laughs> rays of the sun, but now it's not. It's affecting our day-to-day -day lives. What exactly is ozone? So I'm going to wager a guess that we are not too terribly different in our generation because growing up, um, I remember hearing um, from people like former Vice President Al Gore about the hole in the ozone layer and we needed to give up our aerosol hairspray. That was ozone to me. So I, I absolutely know where yeah. you're coming from. There are different kinds of ozone. That ozone layer is incredibly important. It protects the earth. <laughs> what mm -hmm. we're talking about when we talk about air pollution is atmospheric ozone. It's the ozone that we breathe uh, closer to ground level, ground level ozone. Um, and ozone pollution is a combination. It takes an equation. It takes uh, number one, heat, number two, sun, and number three, pollution just to, to say it straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. And when those three things come together, and there's a variety of kinds of air pollution that, that join together to make ozone pollution, but you don't have ozone pollution at ground level without all of those three things being there. It's an equation, heat, sunlight, and air pollution. Um, we live in a place <laughs> where um, there are wonderful things to say about the Houston area, um, but we are also in a place where we have all of those three things. They come together. And this summer in particular uh, was one of our hottest summers on record. And as a result, because we have a significant amount of air pollution from multiple kinds of sources, which we can dig into, we also had a record number of ozone action days. So that's telling us this combination, this equation that we need to get to ground level ozone was at a record level here for the Houston area. Uh, not surprising um, because we know we live in a sunny place, we live in a hot place, and we live in a place with quite a bit of air pollution, which we can you know, dig into as we talk. Gotcha. That makes a lot more sense. Now, on those high ozone days or action days, what exactly happens to Houstonians? What kind of effects do we feel? Right. So ozone can cause a number of effects for uh, just a person who is out in the world. Um, it can make it feel difficult to breathe. It can cause things that sometimes mimic allergies. So sometimes mm. we hear folks talk about itchy eyes. Um scratchy throat, uh, and that can be caused by exposure to ozone pollution. For people who are sensitive, so not your just average person out in the world that might have a little bit of irritation from being exposed to ozone, someone who is in a sensitive group, somebody who is older, someone who is younger, uh, somebody who already has a chronic health condition that makes them more susceptible to ozone pollution, like asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a cardiac condition, mm. heart failure, things that um, are more impacted by poor air quality, they may actually see some pretty serious impacts on an ozone action day. So for someone who's very sensitive, exposure to ozone pollution could be very challenging for them in terms of their quality of life and their health outcomes for that day. So we often say because we are in an area where ozone action days are not uncommon for the reasons I've mentioned, if somebody knows they have a cardiac condition, a respiratory condition, to have that conversation with their healthcare provider, what should I do when I see the ozone action alert come out? And then that, that goes back to that average person going out into the world, being aware of ozone action days. They too might also want to change their, their activities for the day. They might yeah. want to be outside when it's less hot, for example, where that combination is less likely to happen so that they don't feel as affected by, by ozone impacts. So it, it can have an impact on someone just day to day, but also much con very concerning for people who already have uh, chronic conditions, 
that could affect them in a, in a very real way where they would have to uh, seek emergency care or use their um, medications to prevent emergency care. So this sounds like it's a pretty serious issue impacting our city, our citizens and our region. But since 2008, the Houston area has been considered in severe non-attainment of federal ozone limits. How is that possible? How are we getting away with that? And how much do we miss the mark by in terms of being in compliance? That's a great observation to come together. So we know we have an ozone problem. Yes. And so much so that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has said to the state of Texas, you have ozone problems in your major metropolitan area. We are not the only area faced facing this problem. Um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is facing ozone challenges. The Bear County area is facing some ozone challenges. But the Houston um, metropolitan statistical area, Houston, Galveston area, has had a major ozone problem, like you said, for you know, closer on two decades than not at this point. So how do those things come together? We know we have a problem. The EPA has said you have a problem. The EPA sets standards for ozone pollution, and yet we are out of those standards to the point where we are now in severe non-attainment. By the way, there's only mm. one worse place to go after severe. We've only got one more place. So how are we still here? What is this gap? And that has to do with the state's implementation plan for bringing these metropolitan areas into attainment with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for ozone. The state implementation plans have not been effective in bringing us into compliance. That's that's the short answer to that, that long explanation. Yeah. We have not had a truly transformational implementation plan at a state level issued by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality that will bring these metropolitan areas into attainment with the EPA standards. So that's why we are still in a place where we are out of attainment, where we are having record numbers of ozone action days. And there's been years of time lost in getting us into attainment. We are in many ways no closer to being in attainment than we were 10, 20 years ago. Um, and that's simply because the implementation actions put forth by the state tend to, in our opinion, at um, Air Alliance Houston, tend to favor voluntary actions by industry, tend to favor things that don't require industry to adopt perhaps more costly best pollution control practices. And it allows for pollution to continue happening. So it is a twofold <laughs> challenge that we are yeah. in. We are creating the conditions that make ozone action days more likely, and we are not bringing our pollution sources under control. That also put the pollution in the air that create the conditions that make ozone action days more likely. So we, we have to address it on two fronts. We have to have transformative implementation plans from the state that say, okay, point source pollution of the conditions that cause ozone have to get under control. And if we did that at the same time, we could also bring under control the heat trapping gases that are then creating these record levels of, 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 warm, of warm temperatures for our community. So before we get to the rejected proposal that we sent to the EPA, I want to talk about consequences have we been getting fined? Have businesses been getting fined? Like, where are the consequences mm. for us not meeting these standards? Well, ultimately, the consequence of not meeting standards could be that the Environmental Protection Agency says, OK, we are going to tell you, Texas, what your implementation plan needs to be. Mm. And that consequence, um, maybe there's a better word for consequence in that case, because for groups like mine and, and communities that are living day to day with the impacts of ozone, living fence line to the sources of ozone pollution. I don't think we would consider that a consequence per se, but finally an accountability. Yeah. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency delegates its authority to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. That, that authority is delegated. And when the TCEQ it falls short on its delegated authority to protect the public and the environment from pollution, um, that's when the EPA should be stepping in. And I think the rejection that you referred to uh, is a signal that the EPA is taking this seriously. It's a signal that they are watching what's happening in terms of our attainment or non-attainment of ozone standards. So having the EPA come in and say, all right, now you've had time. We've given you opportunities. We've given you ample notice. We've given you ample chances to get yeah. this right. Um, perhaps having EPA step in and... Uh, 
outline what those mandatory changes would be could produce some, finally, uh, true and transformative impact. So we haven't been facing fines or have been fined or anything like that since 2008, mm. right? That's Well, uh, you know, to be specific, uh, the TCEQ does have the ability to fine individual polluters. The fines are not necessarily based on the national ambient air quality standards. They're based on what that institution's permit allows them to pollute. There, there's a whole list of whatever it is that facility is producing that has a byproduct of air pollution, their permit outlines the amount they can produce on an annual basis. So the gotcha. TCEQ does have the ability and they do levy those fines and um, and they do. Uh, there was now with the caveat, uh, they could be issuing more. The TCEQ does not issue the full amount of daily per exceedance fines that the EPA says they can. Uh, we've seen some movement, some improvement. In the last legislative session, it took legislative action. In the last legislative session, the TCEQ was uh, directed to increase the amount of fines. And so now they fine $40,000 per exceedance per day. The EPA says they can fine $50,000. They didn't go all the way to 50. <laughs> um, <laughs> but before this legislative session, they were only fining up to 25,000. And in theory, and this is kind of where theory and practice are, are, are hard to, 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 to bridge. In theory, if TCEQ is fining facilities that emit ozone when they go beyond their permits, and then all those facilities brought their emissions down, in theory, <laughs> you would see an aggregate. You would see ozone pollution come down for the region because all of those sources that are emitting beyond permitted levels would stop. And all these mm. facilities have to apply for permits on a regular basis. They're not lifetime permits. Um, if we were to see more of that accountability, of that, that strong regulatory action, then maybe we would finally see our region come into compliance. And gotcha. the fact that none of that is happening at these individual at this individual scale, now we are seeing at a regional scale, the rejection of a state implementation plan, as you mentioned, by the EPA, because we're not doing those things on a regular basis, much less at a regional basis that would truly bring our region into compliance. Yeah. So tell me about that. The EPA did reject the plan to comply mm -hmm. with the Clean Air Act by reducing ozone levels in Houston and Dallas. Mm -hmm. Why was it dismissed? Well, so... EPA, um, anytime an area is in uh, non-attainment, and like like we've mentioned, the Houston uh, Galveston Sugarland MSA is what they call it, has been out of attainment for quite some time, and we are continuing to be even worse out of contain out of, out of attainment. So, anytime there is non-attainment, the EPA requires a state implementation plan for how the regulatory agency, again with delegated authority, is going to help bring that region into attainment. Uh, what the EPA said most recently is that uh, we are not seeing enough progress made uh, based on your last state implementation plan. So we are rejecting this plan going forward, and we need you to essentially try again. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. not seeing the reasonable progress that we expect when there's state implementation. And in fact, you're not going in the right direction. Um, we need to see more transformational actions taken that will bring these regions into compliance with the Clean Air Act, which is federal law. That is the law. We need to see that happen or we're going to keep rejecting these plans. And then eventually what could happen is that the EPA will simply step in and give a plan to the state of Texas. And I and for many reasons we could talk about too, the state of Texas does not want that. They don't want the EPA to come in. Yeah, Groups like be... mine might want that, um, but they definitely do not want that. So, um, so this is EPA saying, you have a chance to try again. You have a chance to start over. We wanna see actions that go beyond business as usual, that move out of voluntary changes by industry into more mandatory changes by industry, into things that um, show a stronger yeah. regulatory expectation given TCEQ's delegated authority as the regulator for the state. And then at that point, we may allow you to move forward. So now, could we as a state face any kind of federal sanctions or maybe we don't get enough funding for other programs because of this? 
Well, I think the, the, the greatest impact could be the EPA coming in to say, even though we've delegated this authority to you, we are going to take some of that authority back. And uh, that would mean that TCEQ and the state of Texas would have to follow more of what EPA's guidelines are and making decisions for Texas, which again is something that we would, as a state, the state as a whole would not want that to happen. Mm. So EPA is already showing that they will use their tools to push back on TCEQ and as a result, individual industry to say, no, you have to try again with this permit application. We expect you to be, do we expect you to meet conditions? We expect you to use the best pollution control practices that are out there. We expect you to be responsive to community needs and concerns. And we're going to push this back and you're going to try again. I think the rejection of those federal permits, the rejection of the state implementation plan signal, signal a tone, signal a willingness, signal political will, for lack of a better term, to say enough is enough, state of Texas. You need to be reviewing these plans and reviewing these permits truly for the ways in which they protect public health and the environment or not. And the or is we're going to punt them back and it's going to delay permitting and it's going to require you and industry to put in more more pollution control practices, which I am the first to admit have a cost. I mean, they are that that requires investment. And so that could be a sense of consequence when you look at carrots and sticks, that that's a stick that says it's going back and you've got to spend more money on it, try it again. So everything is connected on the state level and the national level. And the other thing that's connected here in Texas is we have neighboring states, right? Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico. What is the good neighbor rule or law and how did that all play out? Like what is happening with that? Because if we're all facing these ozone days, is some of that running off? Is some of this pollution is running off to other states? What's happening with that? The good neighbor rule is one of my favorite rules. I love the name good neighbor rule because it's truly indicative of what that rule is meant to be. And it's related to the Clean Air Act. It, it says, look, air doesn't know <laughs> mm-hmm. where your city boundaries, county boundaries, or state boundaries are. It is going to go where it's going to go because of naturally occurring weather patterns. So this is a rule that says the origin of the pollution has responsibility, Um, even if that pollution is going somewhere where other communities are having to to deal with the impact of it from a health and environmental perspective. So the good neighbor rule sets limits on how much pollution can be blowing from state to state. And the good neighbor rule protects Texans and requires Texans to do things. So we are protected by the good neighbor rule because we get impacted from pollution coming in from other states as well. But it also says to Texas polluters, you have to be mindful of how your pollution is affecting your neighbor as well. So it's another it's another signaling in, in tone and tenor from our current EPA administration that they are going to be holding states accountable to what those rules require. Texas is not the only state whose good neighbor rule implementation plan was also rejected. So that is another message to us and to some other states that, once again, business as usual is not going to cut it. So why did Ken Paxton sue the EPA for that rejection. What was that about? Because I I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that. Yeah. So um, there is, I'm I'm going to paraphrase right now. There is, and as expected, um, our our state elected officials have already started to push back on the ozone state implementation plan rejection. And I'll I'll paraphrase what what they say is that, first of all, um, they, they disagree with the EPA's authority to tell Texas regulatory agencies, what they should and shouldn't do. And the basis on which they disagree is that it is more um, punitive for industry. And uh, that that's mm. a, it's not a direct quote, but I am paraphrasing from yeah, uh, that communication sense. that we have seen. And so they object to the EPA's objection that the priority should be more on, on public health. And so if, if they were to be required to come into compliance, that would somehow um, harm the industrial development that is happening across the state, but very much concentrated in the Houston-Harris County area as the self-proclaimed energy capital of the world. And in my mind, what that says is our state officials care more about 
the ability of industry to operate without impunity than they do protecting the public health of Houstonians. Perfectly said. Thank you so much for explaining all of this, Jennifer. We appreciate you joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Jennifer Hadaya, Executive Director of Air Alliance Houston. You can check out all of their work with the link in our show notes. As we start the week, I have a challenge for everyone listening. Share CityCast Houston with at least five people who need to be better connected to H-Town. You know those people. They're always complaining about they don't know what's happening locally. Well, share CityCast Houston with them. That will do it for today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. 